So, hi everyone and welcome to our presentation on machine learning in market surveillance. Uh, how many attended any of the previous presentations or tutorials on machine learning? Oh, almost everyone. <laughs> nice. Uh, my name is Jens Verén. And my name is Mons Tillman and we're from Skila Surveillance. Uh, and I don't think, I don't know how many of you have heard of us, but we're developing surveillance solutions uh, for market for exchanges into dealer brokers and banks and all the kind of actors that have financial uh, marketplaces. And in case you don't know what market surveillance is, that's what we're doing to try to make sure that we can guarantee a nice and fair playing field for all the traders out there and make sure that all trading is uh, done in a good way. So if we start uh, to place ourselves in this uh, kind of workflow here. On the left-hand side, we have, uh, we have the financial markets, the electronic trading uh, platforms where there are a lot of uh, traders and they are placing orders, they are making trades. Uh, all of these things are generating messages, what we call market messages. And the Skila software uh, subscribes to all of these messages and try to make sense out of the kind of behaviors and patterns that we see there, there. because uh, we don't want any kind of uh, bad behavior and we're trying to detect if participants are trying to trade on some insider information or if they are baiting other participants into buying or selling at uh, unfair prices. And the output of our software is really a lot of alerts. Uh, there for the uh, compliance officers of the electronic trading platform to, to look through and see what has actually happened here. Uh, and these alerts are indicators of potential bad behavior. And in the long run, it could lead to, to criminal charges uh, for, for any participant who are not playing fair. And we all live in a world of big data. And our systems, uh, in our, our biggest clients are Deutsche Börse and New York Stock Exchange. New York Börse, for, for them, the Skila platform um, processes around 5 billion messages per day. And for New York Stock Exchange, we, we process around 40 billion messages per day. And the peak loads are up to 3 million uh, messages per day. And for reference, I think there are around 1 billion tweets on Twitter each day. So it's kind of those um, scales. And so what, what do we do in this world of big data? <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> at one point, sooner or later, people are starting to drown in data. And this is the basic how-to, what happens. We, in our domain, we have, or in our space, we have requirements enforced by legislation, legislation and regulations to actually trigger these alerts on some kind of defined bad behavior. And then we have the compliance officers who are humans who have to, to, to process the output. And since the advent of um, automated trading and the electronic platforms, the, the volumes have just gone to the skies and the work increases proportionally. So for both our users and ourselves, we, we, we need to do something to not drown in data. And, we need, and the thing we can do here is to ask for help. So what we have found here is that uh, we can ask machine learning to come for our rescue. And that's quite a new phenomenon in the financial markets. It's been distrusted because of the apparent black box kind of uh, methods. No one really knows what's going on. This, all this mystery in, in machine learning. But since it's been applied to so many fields in computer vision and natural language processing and uh, location and all other fields, also the financial uh, platforms have started to look into this. And it's very, very nice because we can still keep all the alerts that are triggered based on the legislation, but uh, we can start labeling them, them have ex uh, assisted labeling to say that these are interesting alerts and these might not be as interesting, but still keep them. And uh, 
since all alerts need to be handled, uh, we have a lot of labeled data, and that's the textbook's case for supervised learning. But first, we need to look into what we want to do with this. It's not just starting to label the data. We need to know what we're looking for, and there are two primary accuracy measures. The first one being uh, recall, which is how many of the actual bad alerts do we capture correctly in this label? Or, or no, how, how many of these can we capture at all? Do, do we find all the bad behavior here? And the, the next one is position, and that's just of all the ones that we have labeled, how many of them were, were bad. So and in our space, we really want to focus on the first one because each triggered alert can indicate a serious criminal offense. So we will really need to make sure that we're not losing out on any of the interesting ones, but still trying to label as many of the uninteresting ones as um, negatives. So now that we have defined our problem, we would like to find all the true positives while still filtering out as many false positives as possible. So what we have here is a textbook binary classification problem. And to do this in Java, we have some of the available frameworks. Now, TensorFlow is actually only experimental in Java at this point, but it's uh, said to be fully supported in Java in the future. Deep Learning for J, as we have heard previously during this week, is the primary framework for neural nets. Uh, Spark is a general cloud-based cloud machine learning packages. And Smile is more of use for desktops, but it's still quite useful, has high performance, and contains lots of interesting tools. And then what kind of algorithm should you choose? Well, it highly depends on your problem. Neural networks has been quite popularized by Google for the last decades. And also support vector machines and Bayesian classifiers has been the predominant email spam filtering technique for the last 15 to 20 years. And in our case, it really went down to either neural networks or support vector machines. And both of these algorithms have their different pros and cons. But in the end, we went with support vector machines because we have, together with our customers, extensive domain knowledge, and we would like to use this. And this can be well incorporated in the support vector machine algorithm. Also, we know which features to use, and these are the parameters of our alerts, also from legislation and regulation. Uh, we made a proof of concept, and this gave us quite high accuracy, 70% correctly classified, even though we had some poor data quality. So we really believe that with some refinement, we can ramp this number up. Also, support vector machines is actually an optimization problem. So it does not have the black box sort of look to it as a neural network. And this, of course, gives very, very nice, um, this gives transparency to the algorithm and confidence to our customers. Because when you're dealing with your money and transaction, no one likes to hear computer said so. Also, it's a very fast prediction, which allows us to use it in real-time classification and prediction, which is also a key feature for us. Also, here you can see a sort of sketch of how support vector machines work. The attempt to simply maximize the margin between the two different classes. And the only relevant data is actually the dots situated on the solid black lines, which are known as the support vector, hence the name. And this is how you would implement a support vector machine in Smile. I would primarily like to draw your attention to the first line of the code and the argument of the SVM trainer. The first argument here is a Gaussian kernel. And this is basically how the algorithm should separate the classes. This allows for nonlinear separation. And alternatives would be a linear kernel or, for instance, a sigmoid function. But Gaussian kernels are by far the most used because of their best results. The Gaussian kernel basically positions a Gaussian bell or normal distribution around each data point, And the parameter sigma determines the width of this Gaussian bell. The second parameter c is a slack variable. It allows you to have some kind of misclassification, which allows you to better generalize to new data. After all, we don't want to predict the training data. After that, you only need to feed it with your training data and corresponding labels, and you can make predictions. 
You can also implement neural networks in SMILE, but unfortunately, they are just too simplistic and too rudimentary, and they lack more of the commercial grade things and in uh, sorry, uh, uh, performance which you would really need, which deep learning for j on the other hand has. I won't dwell into this too much, but this is really the framework that, we, that you would like to use if you would like to implement a commercial grade neural network. Now, before we show you some, uh, some plots of how this can actually work, I will just make a note on data. And you will see some accuracy plots, the precision and recall. They will be plotted versus these two free parameters, sigma and c. Unfortunately, financial data is just too sensitive to show in public. So we have two illustrative open source data set. One is an astrophysics simulation between muons and other captured particles. And the other one is an actual liver disease data set where we have individuals which has a liver disease or does not have one. So first of all, this data is a four-dimensional data set, but it's projected onto two dimensions. And as we can see here, it's quite easy to separate these two data classes. It's not a straight line, but you could probably by eye just make a pretty good classification. And this gives us very high accuracy. Note here that the recall plot actually goes from 0 0.9 to 1 rather than from 0. So here we managed to classify approximately 97% of all the data points. On the other hand, the liver disease data set is five-dimensional. Here the features are results from blood tests on these individuals. And here the situation is a lot less trivial. There is no real way of separating these classes, at least not by eye. And this is also shown in the result. Probably in this case, the, the features chosen, the blood test, they just simply not contain the data, at least not in this unrefined form, to, to show or to tell whether or not a person has a liver disease. And of course, in that case, we cannot achieve a better accuracy. So, Finally, what we, would like to take would we, what we would like you to take home from this is analyze your data, look at it, and extract any domain knowledge that you have. For instance, you might have one of the classes heavily outweighing the other. You have a majority class. In that case, you might like to do some sampling, just pick a subset of the majority class and disregard the other data. Or you might want to penalize misclassification of the minority class to put them on a somewhat more of an equal footing. You also definitely need to normalize the data. This not only helps numerical convergence, but it also means that you will not have one feature which has a larger numerical value that takes precedence over the other, while it might not be the relevant feature. You should also try to use understandable accuracy metrics. Mercer's correlation coefficient will give you nothing if you do not understand the result. Instead, stick to things like prediction and recall, at least to begin with. So our final conclusion would be, if you have domain knowledge, then you should definitely give support vector machines a try. Otherwise, you can always resort to neural networks, but they are a bit more difficult to work with. So that was all from us. Thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, if you would like more about machine learning in general, or perhaps how to avoid being detected when doing fraud on the financial business, come talk to us. Also, you should fire up your mental JVMs and compile this and run this code, most definitely. And with that, we'd like to thank you for your time. <laughs>